So today I'm going to be talking about Extreme Excel and how a 35 year old desktop app has smashed through the big data barrier. Um, my name is Rachel Bedore and I'm a solution architect uh, for Kyligence. So um, I have a computer engineering background, which is kind of like science. So maybe a couple, maybe less hardcore, but um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here and to be talking to you guys today. So first of all, why Microsoft Excel? Um, well, it's kind of like the great unifier because almost everybody has used it. It's pretty easy to use. Um, it's widely available and um, yeah, it's just like everybody knows pivot table, right? So uh, a great way to get um, analyzed data really easily. And as a fun fact, according to Microsoft, more than 1.2 billion people use Microsoft Office. So that's 16% of the world's population. So it's definitely a lot more than other um, business intelligence tools like Tableau, um, which might be a little bit more niche and have a little bit larger learning curve. So um, Excel is kind of like the superhero because it keeps everybody happy and business moving forward. Um, so we love Excel, it's a unifier, um, but now as we're moving to big data and everybody has larger and larger data sets, it's kind of slowing down and crashing Excel. So it kind of is like the villain. Um, so that's kind of how we're posing this as everybody wants to use Excel and it feels great, but we're kind of getting dragged down by big data. So here's a few of the challenges with Excel and big data. And I'm not sure if any of you guys have experienced this before, um, but some of the things that happen is that it's difficult to access data. So big data is hosted in a variety of different ways. It could be in the cloud or it could be on a server, but a lot of times it's remote. Um, and a lot of times it's a very uh, custom way of connecting to your data set. So if your data set is hosted um, in this environment that is difficult to access, you know, like you have to learn how to do that and figure it out and work with your IT department or whatever. So it can be very difficult to access the data, a lot more difficult than if it was just hosted on your computer. And then with that, it comes to limited scalability. So Excel will get slower pretty much linearly as you increase the data set. So in a typical use case, um, you would expect the larger the data set, the slower it would get. And with that is the slow response time. So that's both just for like loading in the data and also for doing the computations. And then limited number of dimensions. So in Excel, this is sometimes called fields or attributes. Um, this means that you can only uh, analyze um, a limited number of different fields or different things in Excel. So um, in our example that we'll have later, we are using movie data. So like, for example, in Excel, it might be more difficult if you want to look up genres and to look up dates at the same time, you would only do one or the other because it would get slower. So I wanna talk a little bit about modern data systems. Um, so as so for a company or for an organization that's using big data, a lot of times they have these very uh, relatively complex uh, data systems for hosting and processing their data. Um, so you might've heard of a few of these like Snowflake um, and MySQL. Uh, there's often like, People will be using, will have customers use uh, like Amazon for something and also Snowflake and also Redshift for that kind of thing. So they're using a combination of these. And, and as that happens, it becomes a little bit more complex. Um, we're also seeing more data lakes. So a data lake uh, is unstructured and structured data stored together in a central repository. It's kind of where people are moving right now. Um, if you've heard of like Amazon S3 or Azure Data Lake, those are hosted by Amazon and Microsoft respectively. And that's a really popular um, place to store data right now is on a data lake. The problem is because the data lake has different types of data. Um, just as an example, you could have maybe an MP3 file and also store it in the same location as you know, structured data that's in columns and rows. And that makes it kind of difficult to read. Um, so reading that data really quickly becomes harder and harder. So the big data is great, we love it, but it's also um, gets harder and harder to, to analyze, or as we say in the data world, to query. So Excel kind of lives outside of this modern data world because this is an app that's designed to run on your local machine. It's not really um, part of this ecosystem. 
but we have kind of made a way of using Excel with a big data ecosystem. So Kyligence is rethinking big data analytics. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So before we get into that, I'll talk about OLAP, which stands for Online um, Analytical Processing. It's the data structure method that Kyligence uses. So the way that we store data is in cubes um, and we call it pre-computation. So basically you have your dimensions or your fields, like this is the genre, comedy, horror, drama, April, May, June. And then you actually pre-calculate the measure, which would be the average rating. So in this case, it's like 3.56, 3.24, and you store it together. So that way Excel isn't doing any calculations when it looks it up. It's just going to do a lookup. It's just, if you query or you ask, what's the average rating of horror films in April, 1998? It's gonna look at it and say 1998, April, horror, 3.39, right? Or 3.27, like I circled, <laughs> not that one, 3.39. So um, that would be how we are storing data. And we're doing that um, across a cluster, which I'll talk about later, but that enables you to access the data a lot more quickly. If it was just stored like in that data lake, like we were talking about earlier, it'd be really hard for Excel to process all that data, to do the calculation. Um, it would just be like a lot of computational work and be really, even if you could do that, it'd be really expensive because you would um, need a lot of computers. So here's um, kind of just an example. So with pre-computation or with storing it in these cubes, as you increase the data volume, you don't get an increased response time. So you query the data, you'll get it back in about the same amount of time, no matter whether it's a bunch of data or a little data set. Whereas if you're doing it at what we call runtime, so if you're actually processing at the edge at Excel, as you increase the data volume, you're gonna see an increase in latency or response time. Um, so with pre-computation, which is our approach to big data, you don't get that. Um, so it's actually kind of a very simple concept, um, but it's applied to kind of a complex system, which is database system. So here's an example just with that same, and I'm gonna show you this in the demo, um, but this is me using, this would be the pre-computed cube. And then that's kind of the conceptual, but this is what it looks like when I queried on Excel. So you can see it almost is, it's almost similar, right? Comedy, drama, horror up here. And then you have um, 1998, uh, April, May, June, and then 3.27. So that's kind of the, um, just the and when Excel is looking at this data, it's not actually calculating the average at the edge. It's just pulling the data straight from Kyligen. It's just doing a lookup. Are there any questions so far? I know I'm going pretty fast, um, but if you have any questions, just feel free to interrupt me. I, I have a comment, uh, Rachel, just a kind of a clarification. Um, well, actually, no, you're, you're about to talk about the cloud, right? Because uh, I think uh, cluster computing is an important concept uh, and it, it makes everything really hard when you try. It's easy when you have one computer and one program, but if you have uh, one program and you want to run it on 20 computers, you can imagine it's trying to coordinate them, you know, is tricky and, and it doesn't go as fast or as easy as you think it does. So. Um, in order to make tools like Excel really extreme, uh, you've got to do work on the back end. So you, you don't want to you don't want to retrain a hundred million Excel users. You want the, you want to train the data, not not have to retrain the people. And that's kind of what uh, that's what Rachel is describing here with OLAP. So sorry sorry to break in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to talk about, I think I have a slide for to talk about cluster computing, because that's an interesting trend um, that we're seeing more and more of in computing. So OLAP, online analytical processing, which is our method of, um, of pre-computation. Um, this is actually a standard uh, way of doing data analysis. Um, it's something that's used specifically for analysis. So for answering questions like what are our top five best selling products in each state? Um, which products should we sell together in a package? Things like that. It's not necessarily used like a transactional database, which is when you're thinking like, um, you know, if you're, you go to Walmart and you check out a bunch of products, um, they're, they're storing all that data in a database at a real time. Um, that's not really what you use OLAP for. You use OLAP when you go actually analyze that data and you make decisions about the business later on. And if you were doing like chemistry, 
you could use you would use OLAP about if you had like a sensor and the sensor is um, making a measurement every minute. And then after uh, a month or something, you would use OLAP to process that data and to make a determination about the sensor um, or about like your chemical system or um, whatever you're measuring. So I want to take a time out about the cloud because um, a lot of people, when they think the cloud, they think iCloud, which I love iCloud, so no disrespect about that. Um, but it's more than just for storage. And a lot of the big movement through the cloud is about processing. So it's about actual computing. Um, and what the cloud enables you to do is you essentially rent a computer. So um, you go to a, a company like Amazon, uh, which has AWS, Microsoft, which has Azure and Google. Um, there's a couple more too. And there's a few cloud providers that are different overseas, like Alibaba Cloud. Um, but you'll go to one of them and you'll say, I want to rent a computer and in like 20 minutes, they'll give you one. And so you actually end up renting a bunch and that's called a cluster. And then you run your processing over the cluster. So you're doing it all remote off your local computer and it makes it really nice and centralized for your whole company or your whole organization to be doing that processing. Um, so fun fact, uh, Amazon's cloud business, AWS, made up 52% of their operating income last quarter. So this is a huge business and it's increasing. Um, and when people talk about the cloud, a lot of times this is what they're talking about. In addition to the storage component, um, they're talking about hosting, you know, app, apps and hosting, um, hosting different computer programs remotely. So the Kyligence approach is over a cluster. So basically what we do when we deploy um, our software is we go to Amazon or Azure or Alibaba and we say, we need 10 computers. And then within about 10 minutes, they give us 10 computers um, and we do the processing over those 10 computers. Then um, we like store them in this data structure called a cube and we query or we re like look up um, our analysis by, um, by looking at those cubes. So this reduces the load because we're distributing it over a bunch of computers. So it's going to be really fast. And then it also improves the performance and the data management of the whole system um, because you have one central location. So you're not storing data in a bunch of different places. Everybody has the same access to the same exact data. Um, so this is something that um, not every company is on the cloud. Like not every company has moved their data analytics to the cloud. It's something that's happening more and more. And probably at the end of 10, like in 10 years from now, every company will be. So this is kind of a trend that's happening. Um, and it's, it's kind of exciting to be part of it. So now I'm gonna do the demo. Um, while I start the demo, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask. Hey, so Rachel, um, in that you know, 3D model of data slicing, right? You had the pre computate uh, the the values were already filled out, and then when you showed the Excel co comparison to it, you just had the data categorized in the buckets, right? So like one of the axes became a a group, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so I'll do the demo, um, okay. but yeah, this is kind of automated. So yeah, I didn't actually set anything up. This is just an illustration. Um, okay. But yeah, this is kind of like, it's storing the data like this. And then what I wanted to show here is that when Excel, when you pull it up on Excel, it's just doing a lookup on that cube. It's not processing the average at the end like it normally would. And that's why it's so fast because it's just looking it up on the cube. Um, okay. And yeah, and so this is like 1998 and then I cut it off, but it would have like 1999 and then here's the, the months and then here's like the genres. Um, right. So the so way it became 3D is because you use the, the the columns and the rows and then you group them further. Is that how it's becoming? Yeah, the 3D is like just a, like a, it's kind of just to explain it. It's, maybe okay. it's more confusing because we do that. It's not actually 3D, you know, it's just saying that it's actually, when it's storing in here, it kind of looks like this. This is kind of what it looks like. It's sort of in what's called a parquet file. Um, and it just looks like, it's just like numbers and row column names. And then it just looks it up and it, so you could do more than, actually I often have more than just three different dimensions. You could do a bunch. Um, so now but yeah, it's not stored like this. Um, I know that can be confusing. The data structure is actually just, just like almost like an Excel file. 
Yeah, these uh, the term cube has stuck, but nowadays, especially with uh, you know customer sentiment stuff, where you have lots of data of what the customer likes, the, these can be multidimensional, as in hundreds of dimensions. So they're impossible to visualize on the screen. Than that, so a cube is an, is a a, a, a useful. Uh, metaphor, but these are many more dimensions than than three. So, so we, you know, calling it a multi-dimensional cube is a bit of an oxymoron. But uh, you know, multi-dimensional data structure is really the 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 techie term, I guess. Yeah, I mean, just don't think three D. Just think unstructured. I guess that's that's how I should look at it. More uh, yeah, I think maybe maybe calling it multidimensional makes it seem more complicated than it is. Uh, maybe I shouldn't admit that it's not that complicated, but um, it's just storing like a file, you know, like it, it just stores it like this. So it it has these different rows and different columns, and then um, it's as many rows as you want. So you could add more and more, and and you could just add more and more data, and then it stores it in a flat file. So, um, but the cube is just to illustrate like how that works. Yeah, okay. best, best to try not to visualize it or you <laughs> you'll go yeah, I know. mad. <laughs> I'm going to show you right now and maybe you'll, you'll kind of get an idea. And if you have the questions afterwards, just feel free to reach out. Sure. Thanks. Cool. Okay. So I'm in KyLegends right now. This is our like web user interface. Um, I'm going to go straight to my data to just to show you kind of like what my data looks like. Um, so this is what we call a model. It's basically, it's just showing you, um, there's three tables and the tables are um, movie genres um, and then it's ratings data. So anytime a user made a rating between like 1998 and 2005, it's logged here. Um, and then I also have a dates table that just, it's just a lookup of dates. Um, so this data is movie data from a publicly available website. It's kind of commonly used for examples. So that's how we use it. So um, yeah, again, just like any time a user made a rating on this website, um, it would blog it, and then it, um, and then they made that publicly available later. So you'll see um, kind of what that looks like. Um, so I made this model, and basically what I did with this model is I have these three tables, which are just CSV files, and I'm telling Kyligence how the three tables are connected together. So actually, let me show you. This. So like I'm saying that the um, that's bad. <laughs> this one. So I'm saying there's a movie ID in the fact table. So every time that they log a movie, um, it comes up in the database as being like they logged movie three, and then it's going to be joined with the other table, which is just a lookup table of movies with their genre. So then movie three, and then you would look at that and it would say movie three is called. Um, sleepless in Seattle, and it is a romantic comedy genre. So we're joining those tables together, um, and I just need to tell Kyligence how that's joined together. So that's what I did there. And then what I did was I built these cubes. So we call them indexes also. Um, so let me show you. So kind of like um, this one I have, these are like, technically this would be like four dimensions, right? Because I have quarter, the, qu the name of the quarter, the number, the month name, the month number, um, the sum of the ratings and the count. And then that would be the two measures. And then these would be each of the dimensions that's involved. So you're pre-creating these files that have the calculation, which is the average or the sum. And, um, and it's just looking up those tables. So each one of these is like a little table that it's already pre-calculating. So let me look at one that's we hit a lot. So like this is another one. Um, basically what this means is it's just, just a, we just have a file in the cloud and has pre-calculated the sum for um, each of these, for each year and for each genre. That way, when I go to uh, look, when I ask Hylogens about, you know, year 1995 and genre, it just picks it right out. Okay, so to connect to Excel, we actually have a separate product for that. I'm gonna show you, it's a separate solution. Um, so it's called MDX and that's um, just a, it's a Microsoft's query language actually, but we're kind of just using it as a way to connect into the Microsoft tool. So we're kind of using it 
um, to connect into Excel over a standardized way. So like what I was talking about earlier, when we were talking about how all these complex systems and it's like kind of hard to connect into Excel because um, they're kind of live outside the Excel universe. Like this is our portal into the Excel universe, it's MDX. Um, so what I did here was I set up, um, this is actually, it looks complicated, but it's actually, it's actually really, I mostly just click next. So um, I clicked next a bunch of times and then, um, I just had the ability here to create more complicated calculations. So I did an average. Um, I did year over year and year to date. So things like that. So I could create calculated um, measures. So you can, you can use this to make, um, you know, actually you could do, yeah, year over year is pretty complex. So you can even do like correlation. I know that's used a lot in like chemistry also, covariance, that kind of thing. Um, and then I was also able to, and this is helpful like in the business world of like renaming columns. So this isn't too bad because it's just like main underscore genre. And sometimes in like when a customer comes to me and shows me their data set, they have like, I'm not kidding, like they'll be like a hundred characters long, you know? So um, that's really hard for a business user to read that and like just work with that. So this enables you to change the name um, to something that's a little bit more readable. And that way the business user just sees a readable name, but the database and the computer see the actual proper name. And that way um, we call it unified semantic. It's like semantic, like putting the sentence together. Um, it's the same kind of thing. So you just rename it and it helps the business user without interfering with the computation. So I also am able to make a hierarchy, um, which helps when you're using Excel because it's, uh, just, I'll show you when we get to the Excel part, but basically what it um, allows you to do is, you know, that little plus sign on the side of Excel, you can drill down and drill up. Um, and so we have two hierarchies here. We have one for genre, it's like main genre, subgenre, and title. And then I have one for date, which is just um, year, quarter, month, day. Um, and that'll become more clear as we connect it to Excel. So the rest I'm just gonna skip through because it's more advanced. You can translate it to different languages um, and you can also do some like access controls. It's, it's built for um, like to be implemented across an organization. So there's lots of access control and stuff like that, but we don't need to get into that today. Um, so I'm gonna go into, and actually we, we offer this tutorial and I use it every time, which is embarrassing because I should know it by heart, but I don't remember this. So I'm just gonna copy and paste it. Um, but I'm gonna go data, so I'm in Excel now, data, get data from database, from analysis service. I'm just gonna paste in that service server name that I copied from Kyligence. And then I'm gonna sign in with my Kyligence information. And I'm just gonna click through this wizard and just let it do its thing. So this is 25 million rows. So I don't even know if you could load that into Excel. You probably couldn't. Um, but it, this is all hosted in the cloud so it came up that quickly. And now I'm making a pivot table. So I can use that hierarchy that we just talked about. So here's the date hierarchy. I'm just dragging it in. And then I can even drag the genre hierarchy on the other side. And I can put um, like a complicated measure like year over year and it comes up that fast. And like, this is when we're talking about extreme because this is 25 million and um, we're querying against not just dates but also a hierarchy with genre and we can drill down into those. So I can go down to like comedy and you can see there's all these sub genres and it's coming up super fast. Um, so this is something that you wouldn't be able to do unless you did some sort of free computation. Um, and it's something that the cloud is really beneficial for. So another thing that would be fun to do is we can move the date to a filter. And we'll put, um, we'll put in that, we'll find the top three for each year. So I'm gonna do average rating as my measure. And I have set up this so that I can query the top three titles. So we'll, this is all time, all time for us, Gump. Who can, who can complain about that? Makes sense. Um, 
and then we'll just choose a year like 1999 great year for me and yeah you can see that the most reviewed movie on this website in 1999 was fargo um and then it was also star wars both star wars um helpful hint star wars gets the highest reviews like every year so um popular movie we can try just other dates and then you can see if this is called um data mining um, we're kind of pulling like the top three or whatever, and we're doing it really, really quickly. Um, so you can use this and write a Buzzfeed article. It's like, what were the top three most reviewed movies in 2001? So, or do something fun like that. Are there any questions? Do you guys want me to do anything? Are you curious about the top three movies in any year? You can shout it out. <laughs> this is George. Yeah, I just want to uh, comment that sometimes, you know, so we're, we're actually seeing something fairly extreme in Excel, but it just looks normal. And that's kind of part of the trick is that if you did this without, you know, an optimized cloud, then you'd have to go out to dinner and come back to get these answers, right? So in order to deliver it really fast as in under a second, you know, you've got to do a lot of engineering tricks and, you know, Rachel's one user, but there could be a thousand people doing this at the same time. and that that's really the extreme that you don't really see but that you know we're, we try to demo but it's uh it's like oh look how fast it is you know it's, it's hard to sort of visualize why it's extreme but uh but having users just do their regular work on much bigger data sets is extreme but because they don't have to be retrained it uh it looks more mundane so anyway yeah, I'm not sure if you could load 25 million rows into Excel at all. So if you could, yeah, you're right. You'd have to take a little break. Which might not be the worst thing, but you know, if you want to move fast, this is probably the best way to do it. Yeah, I would think like if you are building views for, you know, something like this that brings you the results as you would want them, there is a lot of um, waiting around. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. You don't have to wait and then, I mean, just in Excel, like if you had a 25 million and you wanted to select a row or do something simple like that would even take a long time. So I think that, um, yeah, I don't know if it would, if you would be able to, but um, this allows you, and we only have 25 million in here, but we've done this with like terabytes of data. So it doesn't really have a limit because we're doing that pre-computation. You can do as much data as you want and you still get the great performance on Excel. Um, yeah. I am curious how you built that top three title and what is a set? I mean, just curiosity. Oh, I can show you. Yes. Okay. I can show you. Yeah. Okay, so here's MDX is what I was showing you earlier. This is like the the um the protocol that we use to connect into Excel. So I created a name set in here, and this is just their query language. Um and yeah, I'm using, I think it, it's like enumerated from zero, so I had to use four, but uh, it's just this function. And in our manual, it like shows people how to um, how to do these. So we have a cheat sheet, but um, yeah, this, this is the coding part, I guess. <laughs> but you um, just type in this top count and then, so yeah, we could do it for anything. So the yeah, MDX expression seems familiar from like Power BI days. I mean, I feel like there's like the term measure or, you know, the MDX, it, it makes me think of Power BI. Are, are we encroaching on that um, line where it's like analytics? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Power BI uses MDX as well. It's the Microsoft uh, query protocol. It's very much, it's similar to SQL that everyone uses to query databases, but it's much friendlier uh, and you can do much more powerful queries using more business-like language rather than coding, you know, SQL. SQL can be a little, you know, impenetrable if you're not a real expert at it. Whereas MDX, it's it's a bit easier for a power user in, P, in Power BI or a Excel user to figure out MDX because it's a bit more logical um, than SQL. Yeah, I, I think the MDX and, or like things like Arcade have really, taken over like the actual native query language for a lot of different data sources, which I mean, you know, nobody wants to mm -hmm. sit there and look up SQL functions for <laughs> right. And then natural language processing is becoming more and more popular, which which eventually will 
people will be able to speak to their computers for queries like that. So it's uh, it's a progression. Mm -hmm. well, I have a less technical question, but if you just say you wanted to look at the top 10 titles instead of the top three, like how long would it take for you to change that? That set. Oh, do you want us to do it? Let's do it. Okay, so top 10. So I don't know why it indexes from zero, but it does. The computer -y thing to do, but we're going to do that. Okay, so I just added top 10. And now I'm going to go back into Microsoft. And I'm going to refresh. And then I have to drag it in again. Okay, so the first time sometimes it's a little slow. So yep. Okay, so that took like thirty seconds. Yeah. So that's yeah. cool. It's really easy to change once you set it up. So then, if you wanted like a different, so say you didn't want an average, you wanted some other computation done. That's when it would take like the ten minutes you were saying or whatever to send it out back out to the cloud to to compute it. Um. No, you could add. No, that's only if you wanted to do. So we're not doing a calculation like these. It depends. So, okay, yeah, I see what you're sorry. Um, so, if you're doing a cal calculation on the raw data that you need to actually look at the raw data to calculate, it would take a long time. You would just have to add it to the Kyligen's pre computed cubes. Um, but I already added some in count. And actually, like for a lot of the business stuff, um, you can do pretty much like everything with some and count. Um, <laughs> like year over year, it's just from some and count. But then you could do something more complex than Kyligen's too. Like uh, we were doing something last week, I think um, we were doing variance or, or uh, we were creating a measure. Um, we were creating a measure based on like a pretty complicated um, situation where you would have to filter first and you're able to do that as well. So um, that would, yeah, if you want to do that on the raw data, you it would take a while. You'd have to uh, actually do it at the cloud level or at the data source level, or you would just add the measure in Kyligen's and rebuild and the rebuilding um, is when you're actually like re pre computing so that usually companies will do that overnight. Um, I mean, it only takes like an hour, but at most, but, um, that would be like, that would be the time consuming part was redoing the pre computation, but the query part doesn't take very long. Right. Interesting. But your, so your, your data team would, uh, would try to anticipate your needs and also the system could read your previous SQL statements and learn so it it hopefully will automatically populate it for you if not then your data team would say okay i need the uh i need the box office numbers or or whatever other calculations you want to make um, but it goes pretty quickly the at the first time of course is the longest but then you never have to do it again because you've saved the results so that's in essence you know kind of the way it works All right so in essence, you're not really um, pre-computing all the possible combinations of the different dimensions. You're just uh, pre-computing what the customer wants. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you pick and choose. If you did all of them, it, um, you would have a lot of stores that you'd be using that you wouldn't actually, like we call it hitting, you wouldn't actually hit that cube. So yeah, you pick and choose. And we actually have a AI engine that does it, I can show you. So I find it difficult to pick and choose based on a query because sometimes they can be kind of complicated and hard to read. So what I do is I use our AI engine. So um, my queries have already been optimized, um, but it gives you like a little recommendation and then you can also import them and then it will build the cube for you and build the model for you. So you don't have to pick and choose which dimension combinations you want. And it, it comes up in here as a like recommended index. Um, I don't have any right now, but um, because I already built them all before I started this meeting. But um, but yeah, that that actually is not. It can be tricky, but it's not actually that tricky because you can get started right away with the AI engine. So it kind of depends on how you want to do it. If you want to get started right away, you could just use our engine and um, and have it automatically create the model and indexes for you. So this is a, a great and interesting data set of movies and stuff like that. But it is, you know, compared to something where, uh, I mean, this project started at eBay and they, they had 100 million products, you know, being sold at one time. And so, you know, 100 million records. And then you have, you know, 10 million people's opinion about those products. 
and you you know you write algorithms to factor in if one person likes that and likes that then maybe they'll like this and that's how also amazon recommendations work so the data structures are much more complicated because you know people give you know what their favorite color is and what their favorite movie is and and somehow some people can make some sense of that with the use of, uh, of this stuff so it's uh, it is pretty fascinating how they how they use the data mm -hmm. so are there any more questions or requests for the demo i can go back to the slides um but just let me know otherwise we can go back to the slides yeah i think finish off the slides cool so um great well thank you guys for being so interactive with the demo <laughs> very careful okay um, so as George was talking about, um, we started as an open source um, open source software from eBay. It was called Apache Kylin, or it still is. <laughs> we still support it. Um, so we have an open source product, product uh, which if you're not familiar, open source just means it's free and the community, like they have a community at GitHub that contributes to it and um, tons of companies use it. That's, it's just totally free. And then, um, uh, the founders of Apache Kylin, our open source product, ended up creating Kyligence to have a professional level product. Um, so we offer both and we still support Apache Kylin. We have people like Kyligence who um, commit to it and contribute to the community. And um, yeah, so that's a big part of who we are. Um, we are a startup and we're funded by um, venture capital. Uh, and we have a global presence. So half of our team is in Shanghai. And then we also, as we were talking about earlier, have team members all over the um, world, including in Florida, where I am. So um, yeah, and um, it's been a great journey so far. So um, it's exciting as we grow um, to be able to, you know, work in this sphere of big data as it changes and, and the cloud as that becomes more popular as well. Uh, so just to recap like a little bit a little bit about what we offer so we offer support for all data platforms so it can be a data lake it could be a data warehouse um, it could be on the cloud it's probably a combination of both most companies um, and most of our customers do not just use one data source they're kind of uh, use a bunch of different uh, their ecosystem involves a lot of different tools um, we offer this intelligent pre-computation that we talked about, and as we just talked about, the AI-assisted query optimizer. So we use um, AI to automate the pre-computation so that there's less of a learning curve for people. They can get started right away, um, and then does auto-modeling and auto-building. And then we offer a massive concurrency. So this is a little bit hard to demo. I wish I could, um, but it's actually super cool. So you have a lot of times now um, not just a bunch of people querying at the same time but you would have computers because of like the rise of machine learning a lot of times those programs will be querying um automatically and there can be loads of like thousands of queries at one time um, and our distributed system allows us to accommodate that a lot of companies um if they do accommodate that they charge a lot for that and um, we're not doing that so we allow you to have this concurrency which is great uh, we support BI tools, the major BI tools like Excel, Power BI, Tableau, and MicroShred. Cloud native analytics. So um, this is our uh, our architecture ecosystem. Um, so as we're talking about, we have any data platform, any cloud, maybe Azure, AWS, Google Cloud, Hadoop. Um, and then we have our engine, which does the pre-computation layer, like we're talking about building those cubes. And then the semantic layer, which is when we we're talking about connecting into Excel using those great names that are not difficult to understand um, and creating the complex measures. And then you're able to see that data through Excel and Tableau, um, Power BI, et cetera. We also offer a kind of a separate but <laughs> related solution um, called Pivot to Snowflake. So that allows you to do the thing we just did on Excel on Snowflake. Um, which is very popular right now. Um, and you can do it with or without building indexes. Um, so you can build indexes if you want really fast query performances or build cubes and indexes if you want that performance. Um, if you don't want that performance, it's fine. 
um, we can correct, connect directly to Snowflake. This is not something that Snowflake offers um, uh, natively. Um, you would have to use a tool like us to be able to do that. And I think we do it the best. Uh, so it's a great solution. Um, so if your company is using Snowflake and you would like to see the data in Excel, um, please talk to us because we can help you with that. Here's the architecture for that. Um, so it's pretty much the same, um, but you have Snowflake here, which is your data source. And then you would use us for the semantic and you don't have to use it for um, the pre-computed cubes. You don't even need to build cubes to do this. And then you would connect in to Excel. So um, in conclusion, the cloud makes Excel extreme. Um, it's more than just for storage. Uh, and we offer through OLAP um, on a distributed cluster, we offer like extreme scale and extreme concurrency. Um, and we are able to also offer other things like the semantic layer, which makes it a lot easier to use big data. And we offer pivot to Snowflake so we can run on Snowflake. So thank you. And if you guys have any other questions, just let me know. Um, yeah, does anybody have any more questions? That's okay. You can also feel free to send me an email anytime if you have any further questions or you want to see a demo um, for something specific, we can always set that up for you. So thank you guys so much for joining. Um, it's been great. You guys have a great community. Uh, thank, thank you so you. much, Rachel. This is really interesting. I appreciate you taking the time to give us this talk and show us about your product. It's way outside of my wheelhouse, but I love pivot tables. And so seeing that was just interesting. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but yeah, we'll make sure to provide um, your contact information when we send out the link as well. So if people have questions, um, they, they know where to contact you. Okay, yeah, feel free, please do.